Meeting adjourned for the letter. We'll continue to order uh, 602. First order of business is to review and approve the minutes of November 16th and November 28th, 2023. Make to approve the minutes of November 16th, 2023, and November 28th, 2023. Seconded. All righty. All in favor. <laughs> Next up on financial payments warrants. <laughs> okay. Uh, so first thing for the record is the warrant totals that were signed since the meeting in November. There were twenty four totaling one hundred twenty thousand fifty nine dollars and ninety three cents. Sorry, I felt like I was saying that wrong as I was reading it. Um, and then I emailed you out the expense reports. There's nothing new or surprising on here. It's things that you've all seen already to date or we've talked about to date. Um, primarily, we typically talk about budget overages. I want to encourage you to look at the subtotals in each of the categories because we're a, a bottom base budget. So at the end of the year, as long as we have enough funds to cover all the expenses, it's okay if lines go up and down and we cover overages with other line items. Um, going first to the school choice report, one of the things that I wanna point out is uh, buildings general repairs. So that line there, just as a reminder, we've spent about 66,000 or we have had encumbered, I think 66,000. No, we've spent 66,000, which was on the air conditioning that we're waiting for rebates on. And then from there, the extraordinary maintenance line, that's for the engineering fees for the playground project and the front entryway, just as a refresher, because those are big numbers coming out of school choice. So <clears throat> that's over 100,000 there. General fund, uh, we encumber salaries for the whole year. So when you look at the bottom line of the budget currently, on um, the last page, there's only about 8% of the budget remaining, and that's because all of our salaries and wages are encumbered for the year. So we'll have plenty of funds to cover salaries and wages, and then some funds remaining, about 415000 year to date. This may sound like a silly question. What does encumbered mean? Encumbered means it holds the funds before we pay for something. Gotcha. Okay. Basically, just sort of takes it out of your checkbook ahead of time, yeah. and you wait for it to clear. Gotcha. Ending. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cumbered. Fancy <laughs> pending. No, that's not a silly Thank question. It's a great question. Know what that would be there, so. <laughs> it's a really good question. Uh, are there any specific line item questions that you have? Uh, the other thing that I'll say quickly is that recurring theme. You hear this every year from me. Deerfield always has the most personnel changes out of all of the elementary schools. Whether that's just staffing changes or if we have someone on a leave of absence or with unpaid time so we are going to capture some savings in the budget as is typical by the end of the year so we'll talk about how to use those funds as we proceed and tina will have some end of year spending to do with those wages any specific questions i can answer okay thanks thank you You're welcome <clears throat> next up is um placeholder for the goal setting for the committee if anyone has any topics they want to bring up all right here we go <laughs> we'll move on. principal's report yeah so i did send you an electronic copy about three minutes ago so you should have that in your <laughs> inbox um and a couple things i'm going to hold off on to until the budget just to make sure there's continuity and conversation some of them pertain to the budget the first thing I'll talk about is student voice. It's a reoccurring thing for us at uh, Deerfield, really trying to bring student voices in. And um, we did a student survey, and I'll be a talk about that. And some of the questions that came up, that came back, we, have, we were curious about, like some of the uh, answers, such as I put in here, 42% of the fifth and sixth grade students agreed that they contributed to deciding class rules. 37% um, in three, grades three and four expressed that they that teachers made lessons interesting. And so we wanted to hear a little bit more about how they interpreted the questions. Was our survey valid? Were we actually measuring what we intended to measure? And there's a video in there, it's about 12 minutes. So I encourage you to watch it on your own time. It's really interesting. One, um, one big takeaway uh, for one of these topics was when students agreed that only half of the students felt like they contributed to rules, is that fifth and sixth grade students um, make agreements or um, class constitutions, and they were looking at rules as different. 
So it was it was interesting information to bring the kids in and ask them what they were thinking. So we'll do a follow up survey. Another topic that we're working on is we're establishing a DEI committee and um, we're looking at how we can systematically address um, bias and stereotypes that have uh, come up in our community from time to time. And really there's it, it talks in here about community engagement and responding to instant incidents, but in in all of this, we're trying to make this more a systematic approach. Um, how can we put these things and make this part of our culture and community that we're doing? If everybody um, is involved with that. I'm going to skip the DES again for now and the Yankee Candle. And if you want to go ahead and read um, when you get a minute, but voices from the classroom. So classroom teachers, a couple times a year, I'll ask them to just provide you guys with an update what's going on in the classroom, because I think it's fun to connect you right into the building. And at the bottom um, is a little link I sent it out to families to about a Deerfield resident that is creating the driveway art that I thought would be uh, good information for you guys to have to see how our community is pulling this as well. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have a public comment. Are you charge you? <laughs> Can we go to our public comment? Did anyone online have any public comment? Let's see the hand. Thank you. We'll say Jen Smith has dedication because she's selling concessions right now at the basketball game. Uh -huh. <laughs> she's she's just a shout out. <laughs> 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 yes. Can we order? <laughs> order to go. Right. Drop <laughs> off. <laughs> dash, whatever. Okay. All right, uh, next up, we're um, voting on policies that we reviewed last time. Good stack by next time. Okay. Um, Darius, do you have any input on any of these? You were not here when you had our first conversation. Um, yeah, so these are, again, you read them last time, they're straightforward. The removal one is just basically school community membership. It's not necessary. As we went through, um, as the committee, uh, subcommittee went through the handbook, and I'll talk about this with the next set of policies, especially. There's a lot that they're there. They say something, but they're not needed. They're not legally needed. There's no reason why there's, you know, committee members. This particular one we're removing may, may maintain memberships on national, state, and regional school committee boards and associations. Why you'd have to have a policy for that is whatever. It's a filler page. Maybe it was needed back before Ed reform. I don't know. Married enough. <laughs> um, so you're going to hear a lot of ones that are like, well, oh, you can see what they're saying, but why is it, it's just, and it's not part of the master book. And so we only should really, really veer from the master book of, uh, from MASC, if, unless we have our own stamp, but we're doing something different in our district, not just to have policies, to have policies. All right. So that one's a filler one to remove. Okay, so look for a vote for policy DK. Motion. Right motion policy DK. I second that. Okay. So we're with B. We're going with B. Remove policy DK first. Yeah. We'll vote on that one. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Who's, who's marrying in America? Okay. All in favor? All right. Okay. Um, and then there's what? Four, five. We're voting. So the five, you can you can vote as a group. Great. That's my question. All right. So AA. I'll just read through them for you. AA district legal status. AA one is regional legal status, but we we collectively vote, even though your vote doesn't have a weight to that because it's the regional committee. We've been just voting them all along. We've been doing them together. Um, Non-discrimination on the basis of sex is ACA. Um, there's updated language there. Suspension of apologies is BGF. It allows us to suspend our policies. That's a new one um, that we've been doing. CHCA is approval of handbooks and directives. Um, and there's new language there. 
discussion <laughs> to change policies AA, AA1, ACA, DGF, and CHDA. So moved. Mary? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Next up, we're uh, voting on the superintendency agreement that we put into place back in November. Yep. So this is the this is the agreement that you guys actually got a trial run through when you um, discussed the renewal of my contract or the renewal of me as we go to contract. Um, that was kind of our we did a reading of it, then we did a trial run, and now it's now if you like it, <coughs> approve it. If you don't send it back. <laughs> well, I motion to approve the agreement regarding I second. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Um, next up, we have uh, looking at the equity plan. So we also have Laura Ramsey here with us, one of the architects behind this plan. So I get I get I get to start with this, and then um, I just really wanted to show. Whoop, um, I wanted to show this graph on the second page of the plan because I think when we started talking about all these different plans and where does it all fit, we showed you the um, the actually action steps. That was that colored grid that we built from um, the equity um, audit. Um, it was, you know, when we put this kind of visual together, it really helped me. Kind of put it, keep it all together in my mind as well. So I just want to share that first. So we have our four static plans that direct how we're running the district from the curriculum management plan, the professional development plan, the assessment management plan, the equity plan. So those four, they don't really change year to year unless we're making some major changes. Okay. From those plans, you know, we we have a district strategic plan. This district strategic plan can kind of point out sometimes, but it, those those practices are feeding into what we're putting into our district strategic strategic plan rather and then the three green plans on the bottom are what you're seeing annually and voting on because there's a lot of change so you, you'll see our usually our pd calendar comes out in april may um, school improvement plans come from um, a school council that gets before the school committee and then also now the new equity action steps that we showed earlier this year um, that we kind of organized out over several years about what we're working on in those different things so that's kind of the flow and the green plans are updated every year so there's a lot of fluidity in those um, in the blue plans um, on the top are, are more static. So in the equity plan that you have in front of you, um, Laura, I'm going to, you good, you good to take over? Yeah. I'm going to have, Laura yeah. really speaks fluently in this area um, instead yeah. of me reading out my notes. If you had a chance to look at the equity plan, you'll see that it starts with um, highlighting parts of the curriculum, of, of looking at the blue plans at the top portions of the blue um, the curriculum plan, the professional development plan, and the assessment management plan that are um, um, that speak to equity, um, priorities for the district, expectations, practices, and expectations. Um, it's important that equity isn't siloed as its own plan, but that it's embedded in all of our plans. So first we highlighted what's consistent um, and related to equity and the other three static plans that guide our district plans and our annual action plans. And then in addition to that, this equity plan um, speaks to, um, just want to highlight a few things. Um, it reiterates in expectations for instructional delivery. It is the only place where roles and responsibilities are around um, managing, implementing, monitoring, evaluating equity in our district. Um, it, it assigns the roles of school committee, superintendent, directors, teachers, admin assistants, um, it outlines monitoring and evaluation procedures and community engagement. Um, and in the conclusion, just that it's essential to involve stakeholders, including students, parents, teachers, the community, and development and implementation of the plan. And it sets out the expectations that are static so that every year the annual plans are supporting an ongoing and consistent effort and that it's not um, a completely pivoting annual plan. If you have questions about it, then can discuss. I have a few questions. Yes. Um, and we talked about some of these things already here, but I thought it was helpful just to like talk about it again in context of equity. Um, 
I saw that there was stuff kind of focusing on tracking absenteeism a little bit more. And I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about why that's important in terms of an equity plan. Absolutely. Um, well, attendance to school does have a correlation with um, achievement and growth in school. And when we look at the state data, which we, um, the state tracks it and sends it back to us. We would like to do a better job in tracking it internally. So we do have as part of our action plan, investing in Tableau, which is a data system that will allow us to quickly access and cross-reference lots of demographic groups and lots of um, student criteria. But when we look at the state data, um, students with low income have a higher rate of absenteeism and there is a large disparity between students with low income and MCAS achievement scores. And that raises questions that we need to consider as a district, such as, is it something about our curriculum that prohibits low income students from accessing the content or is it about attendance and understanding the data better will help us understand how to close that gap in achievement and address mm -hmm. the right problem. Right. If I can add to that. So the state right now, if you're following the state politics going before the state board, is they're looking to change the accountability level of the MCAS, not the MCAS, but the <coughs> full assessment system. They're going to look at and they're going to make attendance go from 5% to 20% of accountability of schools. Yeah. And so the question is, will the board pass that? There's a lot of debate whether school should be have that much weight of their accountability on whether or not students walk in the front door and so that's in speaking you can hear a little bit in there like if there's a, some work there and i don't think that but i'm not sure they should fall under accountability of schools but because they're saying students who are not coming through the front door are not achieving and that should be one of our priority to improve achievement is getting to the front door which makes sense i'm not sure they should be changing the accountability scores <laughs> um on that but um that's going in front of the mass board i think on the 23rd 26 it's the end of this month so they they gave this in a conference with the commissioner last week on tuesday or wednesday and they gave us till friday to give them feedback okay. it was well, really kind of this quick turnaround so but two things that haven't recovered since the pandemic are attendance and equity gaps in um, progress so if there's a connection this is a good time to and the state just sent yeah. out um chronic absence and student attendance to us because we haven't recovered and talking about the accountability piece which yeah. it is a big push for us yeah. well and i think you know regardless of what's happening at the state level be, being able to have our own data and not just making assumptions right 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 yes. i think i also think the things that we are not measuring even necessarily as a state or necessarily as a community is like kids immune systems recovering coming back to school and I'm, i guess right. i'm speaking just from my own experience with smaller kids you know they were locked up for three years and then all of a sudden they're in school environments and even though we this is the second year of like really being full at it i just i think kids are getting sick too and parents are used to the like if they have a sniffle they can't go to school right. so it's, right. i think there's it, there's a combination of things and being able to have the data to look at that how it applies to our school is really important you're absolutely right in that we're seeing that we're also seeing mental health days you know more often than we've seen in the past where people are looking at mental health a little bit stronger and also you know you seem to overwhelm you can take the day off from you know and that can be abused very easily it can also be used appropriately and so i don't want to make judgmental on tv here but and then um you also see people taking vacations they kind of got in the habit that they can you know, during or they felt that we're still making up for years lost and we can take a week or two off. Um, and so but if you add those all up, they're all in, you know, they're all on there. And so I'm not judging with people taking vacations. I understand that as well, but they all add up. I was happy to see the section on world responsibilities spelling out who was responsible for what. That was something that I know I was struggling with was when we move on from the equity audit like what does that look like and how we're making sure work is getting done and by who it's also interesting or having to try to figure out that the ways that the policies and the statistics translate into on the ground relation you know because really a lot of it i imagine would have to do with that uh, sense of belonging and mm -hmm. ownership of everyone involved in the process of learning. And I mean, I, 
you know, uh, all do credit to everyone for getting kids to feel, you know, some kids you don't have to even, they love being in school and then there's the hard sell for some others. And, uh, you know, to make it so that it's like, there's something interesting, you know, what are you looking forward to today? And, uh, you know, trying to make that, um, you know, but while keeping all those numbers in the back of your head, but not like translating it into hello number 342, you know, like you're not, right. you're not doing that, but it's, it's, I, I don't know, is there any, well, there's, yeah, I think that's more of a comment than a question. I don't know that I, I think our district is going to interpret this push as an opportunity to call families in as opposed to mm -hmm. ostracizing families for not having strong attendance, but do you want to talk about attendance can we have a family meeting and you know having more outreach so that that belonging piece is there sure. um i think that the, the state push on attendance could go either way in terms of shaming people more mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, creating some resistance to um yeah compliance with attendance rules right. but um i think we're gonna look at it as a chance to say what can we be doing to get you here on time what can we be doing to get you here more mm -hmm. yeah yeah make no, that makes a lot of sense because it is that it's the how you, how we all express those, you know, like what's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is for people to feel included and belonging. Right. So mm -hmm. shaming people is not right. the way to go, but it's, you know, but yet, you know, yeah. So you're trying to get, it's it's having the right <laughs> lens on it, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, whatever, you know, let us know what ways we can help, you know, do that. I'm curious, what is the role of the anti-racism and equity committee going forward from here? And are they going to continue on working and, and keep reminding this or? Yes, we um, just codified it with this equity plan. Mm -hmm. By writing it into the equity plan, the district is supporting this um, district-wide group of stakeholders from different perspectives and the opportunity to meet. I think we vote four times a year, at least more if the committee is taking the initiative to meet more, but just so that if the people who initially expressed interest leave, their kids graduate the district or the teachers move on, that we'll still have it as part of the plan. And um, right now the plan is that the group is, it's a chance to raise uh, issues around awareness so people could, it's an open agenda. It gets passed out to anyone who wants to be on the email list in advance of the meeting so that anyone can add to the agenda if they have a topic to bring up and share and discuss. But it is also a regular opportunity for the admin team to report back on progress on the annual equity plan. So it functions as a bit of a, um, yeah, it's just a way to keep track of our progress and not let go of our vision and our, our goals for the year. So whatever people put on the agenda, plus a chance to like speak to progress that's being made on the annual equity plan, the action steps. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I had another question just to, um, and Darius, maybe we'll speak to this, but how does our plan help us sort of abide by whatever DESE requirements there are around sort of like, because I know DESE, what, two, three years ago, kind of like reworked some mm -hmm. of their requirements. Yep. How does this fit into that? I think um, it fits right in. I think we, we kind of went our own way to get here. We kind of got ahead of DESE and then DESE came kind of roaring back with kind of its all of its different initiatives and a lot of professional development selling, mostly selling, but selling a way to get there. Um, and we were already on a different way. I think we're at the same spot, at the same spot because we're looking at, we look at the plan, accountability and curriculum is there. Accountability in um, professional development is there. Accountability in, in assessment of teachers and administrators is there. So that's exactly what DESE's doing. And so we're doing the same thing. So um, we just kind of got there in a different approach. I think we're bias wise, just hearing how people are talking about it. I think we're there holistically because of the way we went there, where it's just another initiative coming through in some districts, you know what I mean? Gotcha. Where they have, you know, they have, they have to do these kind of different things. And while I'm not saying people in those districts aren't 100% for it, we kind of went through by getting having conversations and getting everybody talking about it um with more holistic approach we had a little, and we had more time to do it too so when we when we were doing it we didn't think we had more time to do it but because we took three years to kind of put this thing together and then desi kind of rolled it out and like in the first year next year you need to be doing this and so you had to move the staff along faster whether or not they're were with you or not so that's my yeah opinion 
at the Mass Committee in November, um, the conference, um, I attended a lot of sessions on DEI work, and I'll, for the most part, I was left feeling really good about where our districts are, mm -hmm. comparison to where some others mm -hmm. in the state are sort of like starting their journey. So that's nice to feel. <laughs> All right, any other questions or comments? I just one more, I'm sorry. Don't need yeah, to yeah, hijack everything. I wasn't, so I was, I really liked that there was opportunities for stakeholders to provide feedback. What about teachers? Like that was not as clear to me where teachers fall in that sort of category. It sounds like some schools will have like committees that maybe teachers can join to like participate, but is there kind of surveys from teachers around the effectiveness of PD or how they're feeling about kind of teaching this stuff? Right now, um, our surveys and our feedback forms for teachers are unique to um, feedback on a curriculum or feedback on a professional development initiative. We don't have, uh, what do you think about our equity survey? It, you know, it, it generally, it would be more specific to a PD training or to yeah. a curriculum that we adopted and, try, and have been using for a year. And the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee is open to all teachers. It's one of the, you know, I think the last time we met, we had equal numbers of admin teachers and community members at the last day any meeting. So those are the vehicles um, at this point. Mm -hmm. But if you're making a recommendation or something. We, we are ahead. surveying teachers about the PD, about equity. So That's what they I mean. didn't, they didn't yeah. think the PD was effective or wasn't hitting things. They're giving yes. that feedback. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, teachers just seem like a very important part to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, their enthusiasm or like really believing in it and buying into it seems to be an important part. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever vehicles y'all are getting yeah. feedback about that is important. It's not one of the most important parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not happening with the teachers, yeah. it's not happening. So yeah. well, okay. oh. um, roles and responsibilities, school committee create and adopt policies to guide inclusive and equitable practices. Um, it's hard to it's it's like, yes, I get that. I like that, but how do you manifest <laughs> that? <laughs> um, but the, perhaps it's in line with what you're saying to be able even if it's just to like hear ye hear ye we declare that people should do things in an equitable way or you know i mean that's a very very uh simplistic way of looking at it but that you know there could be some sort of a position given from the school committee towards that you know the that overall umbrella that would tie that all in together mm -hmm. Perhaps we can put that in a goal plot mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I agree with the roles of thoughts for pity. It doesn't that's give us that much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's like an opportunity for us to, mm -hmm. to, to do some, some of the same PD that we mm -hmm. Right. Think, yeah. Like yeah. Smith. yeah. Do some research and learning on our own to, right. Right. to right. determine which policies. And well, tonight you voted in the new language we will not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity that wasn't in before so thank you for doing that <laughs> you know that's actually not small that's really a big change i'm not sure that all school committees are adopting maybe that's true, but i don't think they all are and to somehow make that more <clears throat> evident i guess yeah. than just a byline and you know a 73 page document mm -hmm. um but as a guiding principle Unintended, Tina. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and then of course ensure adequate funding for implementation, yeah. like funding <laughs> PD and asking about the yes. effectiveness of right. PD and how the teachers feel about it. Yeah, thing. yeah. And the new curriculum is vetted for um, being, having culturally responsive resources and culturally responsive teaching strategies get promoted, and it's expensive to get a new curriculum like that and to do the training that goes with it and your support makes a huge difference in the district's ability to keep moving forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Next up, we are doing a first read on policies to change and policies to remove. And it's okay. So I have a summary I can kind of fire through um, if you want me to. 
Yes, please. All right. And so that you can kind of get the, the strong first read so that the second time through we won't do it this way. Um, so again, kind of what I'm saying before, um, uh, some of these are adding language of law that's been updated, and I'll try to kind of go through as we do that. So EEAEC is also JICC student conduct on school buses. The, cost, the cross reference is not in place and should be in both places. Um, so that's conduct on school buses. EEAG is student transportation in private vehicles. There's an updated language around quarry checks. Again, we do this in practice. And I'll keep on saying that a lot of these is not, not changing what our practice is, but it's making sure our policies say that we're doing that in practice. So if you're a parent volunteer driving a student, you have to be court. Um, BGI, staff participation in political activities. Um, basically, it allows um, staff participation in political activities outside the work day. So you can't be um, uh, uh, you know, putting forward political um, things in the classroom. GCA is political is professional staff positions. It's a um, this is a new policy, but basically it says you should have job descriptions for every policy and that they be approved every position and they be approved by school committee. GCK is staff assignments and transfer. This is again another new policy, but it basically gives a language around how teacher assignment um, practice is done. Um, again, it's we follow that already in place. GDB is staff uh, support staff contracts and compensation plans. This is again another new policy. Um, our current um, staff contracts follow this current practice, and we also have a staff handbook for non-union employees that follows this practice. HB is negotiation legal status. Um, it's just legal language around the negotiations being a legal um, a legal practice and. They say we should have it. I read it and not really understand why we need it, but they say we should have it. Um, JF is school admissions. This is, again, a new one. This is for admissions, new admissions to the school that follows their current practice and how they come into kindergarten. Um, JFBB is school choice. Um, there are updated dates in the school choice about what time frames we have to make our decisions by. We usually make them earlier than what it says in that policy when you read through it, but, you know, that we can go before, you just can't go after those dates. And JFBB1 is Frontiers, which has different dates. Um, they go a little bit earlier. Um, why don't you go into removal policies? Sure. Here to just read. Um, all of these are not part of the MASC Master um, School Committee Guide recommended policies. So some of them have been removed over the years and either previous administrations, it couldn't have been me, um, missed it, or um, for some reason we have one of the books that they didn't have. So the first one is administrative reports, CL. Um, you can ask for administrative reports all the time. You don't need a policy that kind of spells out um, something we haven't been doing as well um, for annual reports. Just as a clarification, these are these are pieces that were removed previously and we want no, to No, we're looking in, to remove them. They yeah. currently are on the books. And again, this is where this is your subcommittee that voted to say that agreed that these need to be removed. Um, FBB is enrollment projections. Um, we used to get um, NASDAQ's um, five year predicted enrollment and they were wrong forever. I don't think they ever were right. So we stopped paying, we used to pay thousands of dollars for it. And we, so we stopped paying for that. We get our enrollment projections based on what Kim tells us what's coming up through the through the community and um, birth reports in town. So that's really the only predictor of things that we have that can get us that. So um, five year, making up a five year enrollment projection is not needed as a policy. Um, <coughs> GA, um, personnel policies and goals, not part of the master document. Um, and this has been replaced by our equity goals around staffing. So we actually have more than what MAS sees around that when we talk about equity goals around staffing, a policy that you approved last spring. Um, GCCD is domestic violence leave policy. Legally, this has changed. Um, if you look at the data on that policy, it's, it's many years old. It is no longer recognized by, by MASC. It does fall under protections in other policies and such as FMLA and other legal frameworks. GDQD, suspension of dismissal of support staff members, is not, again, not part of it. Um, it's not needed. Uh, it's not needed process. It's found in the collective bargaining agreements for those under the collective bargaining agreement, and it's found in the handbook um, 
or law legally for those outside of it or their individual contracts such as administrators. GCQE, uh, the retirement of professional staff members. If you read it, it basically just says they're letting people retire, which you really don't need a policy to do. And GDQC is requirement of support staff members. Again, both these are not um, part of MESC and are not needed. Can you tell us these things anyway? Who's that? We we get informed about that kind of thing. Anyway, yep. So. yep. Um, H negotiations. It's just a bunch of filler language as I read it. It's also part of the not of the MASC um, overall agreement. JBA um, student to student harassment. Um, can now is now has been is no longer part of MESC's thing, but is you, is found under sexual harassment, bullying prevention, harassment of students, and non discrimination policy, including harassment and retaliation. <laughs> so they got a, rid of that one. They put all the um, policies within those other four um, um, student based and harassment based policies. JHBBA is public absence notification program policy. Um, we have the attendance policy in the handbooks that you approve um, both at Frontier <laughs> and at the elementary school. And then there's also the law behind that. JHC religious holidays can now be found under JH. Um, in, you don't need a separate section because under regular absences, religious holidays is, is defined within that. And then JKA, corporal punishment. Yep, can't hit kids. You don't need a policy that says that. I don't think anybody's confused anymore. Mm -hmm. We call it just assault and battery nowadays. <laughs> All right, so if you have questions on those between now and the other one, feel free to send me a note and I can try to answer anything you got for the next meeting. Okay, thank you. All right, there's no questions now on that. We can move on to the FY25 budget. Yay! <laughs> I'm so excited for this. <laughs> All right. Look how pretty it is. It's so pretty. It's really pretty. Your new fair. It's your logo. Isn't it cute? Oh, I love it. <laughs> It's one of them. It's one of them. <laughs> You're going to see many throughout the presentation. I tried to use them all. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll try to move through this as quickly as we can, but there's a lot of information and a lot of moving parts and different pieces. Don't forget, this is just the first presentation of the budget. We have several months to talk about these things. And uh, Darius and I both feel like this is a much easier conversation this year than we've had in the past. So. Everybody sort of <laughs> sigh of relief for a moment. Uh, before we get into 25, let's look back and reflect on 24, because I think it's important for us to, to recall what we went through last year and some of the challenges that we face. So we ended up adopting a 3.26% increased budget. Uh, I'm not going to read all of those factors for you. You can read them on your own. The, the primary driver was our wage increase. We had some non-wage increases, which is you know typically facilities or utilities related. Um, we had a revolving fund adjustment because we anticipated our revenues to go down in uh, several revolving funds, um, special education revolving and early childhood revolving, I believe were the two that we were concerned about last year. Uh, we had a significant discussion about uh, eliminating two sections and two different grade levels and actually talked about eliminating a possibility of a third uh, section, which we ended up funding with ESSER, we felt like. Two changes last year was a big move, and so we funded uh, 62000 off of the budget with ESSER funds. So bringing us back a little bit to the beginning of the conversation, we started off with level services last year at a 7.15% increase, which is why we came to the decision of re reducing grade levels and consolidating classes and eliminating staff. We knew we couldn't go in with a 7.5% budget. Uh, so that reduction in staffing saved us about $100,000 last year, which is a pretty significant amount. Um, so moving into this year, we are in a really positive financial position because of these big 
hard, challenging decisions that we made. So I applaud the committee for supporting the administration's recommendations and trusting that the right decisions were being made for the students and the staff of the school. So we, we did the right thing, even though it was really hard to do. So let's look at timeline quickly, because you haven't talked or seen anything from Darius or I about timeline. So quickly to fly through this, first presentation is today. We'll have a follow-up meeting in February at the next school committee meeting where you'll see a second draft or we'll continue conversations. March, we have two meetings scheduled. We have the public hearing and then a vote to adopt. And then I believe the town meeting is April 22nd, which I put in parentheses because that's just my guess at this point. It's the first Monday, the last Monday of the month, right? Yeah. Um, at least that's historically what it's been. So the last Monday be the 29th? 29th. Yeah. Maybe it's the third Monday then. I looked so at the last, the last two dates. Is it always the last? That's why I wasn't sure. And it's not the last yet. So. Right? Yeah, but I think it was the Monday after last year. We'll update it April. for next month. It's towards right. the end of April. Hopefully it'll be published at that point. Have it well, I have to, where did you put that in there? Before? I might have put it in. Yeah. Because last year, I think it was like the 24th, but maybe that was just the way the calendar fell. Okay. So um, anyway, and, we'll update And just to add on to what Shelly's saying, there, that means that at the end of the February meeting, you want to have a general number where you are because you're going to go into a public hearing to discuss that. So, you know, timing-wise and decisions at the end of the next meeting, you got to be in a general, you want to be the, you can, you definitely can shift things around, but you want to be in a general ballpark. And when you go to public hearing, you can't really increase the budget unless you have another public hearing. So you kind of want to be either at or be reducing at that point in March. Right? Done. All right. Uh, so some of you, most of you at this table have heard this before. I don't think anyone is brand new. Nope, uh, not this year. So, but I'm going to go through it for the public, uh, talk quickly about budget development. So our goal during budget development is always to plan a needs-based, student-centered, fiscally responsible budget for the upcoming school year. Uh, Tina does seek input from stakeholders, staff at the school-based level, and then Darius and I talk to other administrators. So we're having discussions about early childhood, we're having discussions about curriculum, we're having discussions about IT and facilities, and all of that comes together in each of the drafts that we move forward with. Um, it's important to note that level services does not result in level funding. So there's always a cost with level service, primarily related to COLA increases or step increases for contractual wages. Uh, and then also for non-contractual staff to receive increases too. And then we look at expenditures from prior years and adjust for inflation or anything that we've been over budget on. Um, there's two other steps to the process. One is looking at new needs and initiatives. So making sure that we're presenting to you things that we would like to have and or need to have as part of the first draft of the budget. And then also looking at our revolving funds, which I talked about in that first slide. We review to make sure that the revolving accounts can manage the expenses from the prior year. And if they can't, then we have to make adjustments. Same thing for grants. We make sure that the grants that we rely on are going to be consistent year to year. I'm not going to read through each of these, but I think this is helpful for you when you're looking at your monthly reports as well, not just in talking about the budget. And I will send this to you electronically because you did not get this yet, um, but I'll make sure you get it at the end of the night. I'll send it off. So these are the function codes. So when you look at the expense reports and we talk about the budget, there's these different categories that set by DESE. District administration, instruction, pupil services, operations and maintenance, benefits and fixed charges, and then out of district placements. There are other codes. These are the primary ones that we use that you're gonna see over and over again on expense reports and as we talk about the budget. Um, the biggest one here for us you're gonna see on the next slide is that our budget is primarily made up of expenditures that relate to direct instruction, student and teaching. That um, makes up about 75% of our budget. Pupil services is anything related to um, the nurse's office, transportation, food service, um, athletics, which is really just for the middle of high school, not here necessarily, um, school security. And what I wanna say about benefits and fixed charges is that this is a smaller piece of the pie when you look at our budget because the town pays employee benefits for our staff. So that if you see Frontier's budget, that number is much more significant piece of the pie than, than for the elementary school. 
All right, budget drivers. So this goes along with what I was just saying in the last slide. Um, a few of the major budget drivers, salaries and wages is always going to be our largest budget driver, facilities and operations, transportation, whether that's regular transportation or specialized transportation, and then special education costs. And this is just a general graph. It is a theme district-wide, if not a theme statewide, that um, instructional expenditures make up three, uh, three quarters of the budget. Um, and then you can see there what the other primary drivers are, especially for a small school, um, facilities, maintenance, operations, those are some of our bigger ones. Central office falls under district administration as does um, school committee expenses. So when you go to conferences or if there were stipends in um, your agreement with the town, then that would fall under their supplies and materials, those kind of things. All right, so let's look at the actual numbers for 25 now that you have some info about how the budget is built. So this is first glance. Um, before I get into some explanations, I just want to say that level services at 1.83% is really attractive considering we were at 7.15 last year. So when I said earlier that your um, decisions last year were fiscally responsible as hard as they were, this is why we did it, because we could not maintain the level of expenses that we had with the revenues that we have coming in. So we made some good decisions as hard as they were to make. Uh, and this is where that 96,000 is made up of. Uh, so wage increases, non-wage increases, and then an adjustment to add back in what was paid from ESSER last year, which we're gonna talk about a little bit further down the road. Um, some details about each of these categories quickly before we move on. So the COLA for both of the contracts is 2% for unit A and unit C next year. Uh, teacher stepping is really consistent in the teacher contract unless someone is going to step 14, which is where they sit before they hit that 19th year of completion for longevity. So that step is always much more significant. Or if there's column movement, the step or the raise is, is much higher. Um, but generally for teachers, it's 3.19%. So at a minimum, our teachers should see a raise of 5.19% in their salary. For uh, Unit C, the steps are not as consistent the way that the salary schedule is built, but uh, staff will generally uh, receive between two and a half and three and a half percent on top of the two. So our numbers there. Just for clarity, I'm forgetting what Unit A and Unit, unit C. Unit A is the teachers, anyone that falls on a teacher contract. So it's not just grade level teachers, but all related service providers, um, special education, interventionists, um, any of anyone that has to have a decibel licensure, basically. And then unit C is IAs or any other medical support staff. So it could be a PTA, um, an occupational therapy assistant, a um, LPN, those kinds of positions. Thanks, so that's a good question. Um, so let's see, central office. This is a big one to talk about for Deerfield and it's helping the budget. That number is not typically a negative, especially not a negative 20,000. There's two factors here. Deerford enrollment is going down, which you know, as a result of consolidating class sizes and having less school choice students, our numbers are dropping. That impacts the cost share percentage that Deerfield contributes to central office positions. So it's almost a 2% reduction, which has a significant impact. The other factor here is that this year we're seeing the savings from the nurse leader position. We made the change after last year's budget was approved. So we're realizing those savings mm -hmm. this year. So that combination is resulting in some significant support for the budget this year. That could fluctuate year to year and it usually does a little bit. I don't think it's going to change a ton for Deerfield knowing that our enrollment is going to continue to see a decline, which we're going to talk about as we go through the um, presentation. But next year it might be, you know, 5,000 increase or, you know, maybe a 10,000 increase. It, it shouldn't flip so dramatically that we're seeing 20 plus thousand in this category again. Um, Non-wage increases, this is pretty minor this year. This is based on actuals from the prior three years. So I look at all of our expense codes and see what number, what line items were really over. Contracted services for um, grounds maintenance is one of the lines that continually goes over. Um, trash continually goes over. 
uh, accounting software fees keep going up. That's a central office expense, but it still trickles down to the school level. So all of those pieces, I've sort of analyzed and figured out what we need to do for an increase. It's a minor amount, not significant. Some years it could be much more. And then the ESSER adjustment, even if we still have ESSER funds available, which we do and we are going to talk about, my first step is to always pull that off to say, if we didn't have this grant any longer, that is a one-time grant, what would our budget look like? So we're plopping that 62000 back on here. So even before we get to um, any of the other pieces of the presentation, this is an excellent starting point. Tina could come in for requests for two new staff. And we're still not going to be anywhere near where we were last year, which we're not requesting to new staff necessarily in teaching positions. Um, but it, the point is, we're just in a really healthy spot right now because of all the hard work last year. All right. Let me see what's next before I keep us going. It's Kim and Tina next. I'm going to hand it over for the next part of the discussion to Kim and Tina because. Part of this conversation, while we have the opportunity of a healthy budget and some attrition uh, due to retirements, we want to talk about the options of adding programming at Deerfield Elementary. So I'm going to give it to them to talk about the program, and then we'll bring it back to what the financial impact is. Do you want to take the lead? Sure. I, I'm so happy to come here and talk with you. And I just want to emphasize the responsiveness of Deerfield and Deerfield community with the children that they have coming through. And I had to come to the school committee 14 years ago, and we needed three installments of uh, preschool given the needs of the children. And we're at that point again where we're looking very closely at the needs of the children that we have, the complexity and the intensity of the services that they require and we would like to set up a new program for them that is an early childhood based program that includes students that we know very well and love and that also has an opportunity to grow and expand we are looking at low incidence children right that we need to service very well with an inclusive framework in our in our mind and give them opportunities and we're looking at a program that really spans that pre-k k and one so that very early learning the early development and what that looks like and there's a lot of nuances to that so in response to the students that we have currently and the needs that are presented that include um, multiple handicaps, medical needs, complications that really need a nest to come around for these children to learn, to support their learning, to have them be included as much as possible is what we're really proposing today. And we're excited to be able to do it. We've had a lot of conversations around this. And I love DES Den. That was it's Tina. A, not a nest, it's a den. It's a den. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, no, <laughs> that would be frontier. <laughs> but really, it's 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 a beautiful idea. You know, we've brainstormed and written a lot of kinds of things around it with specific children in mind. And it's very exciting to be able to have the opportunity logistically, space-wise, financially, um, to really be responsive to the needs of our community. We have about five to six students possibly identified already. Um, low incidence. Yes, yeah, so um, children with rare genetic disorders, right? Uh, that or um, complications through the birth process that leads to multiple handicap. Um, uh, significant trauma that leads to some kind of presentation that needs a different kind of approach. And I know it's in the papers all the time or, or when you read that children are coming with more complexities to school in the way our, our towns are set up, it's low incidence at each school in the early childhood. So could we build something here at Deerfield to be responsive to the families and the students that we have now, but also to be a beacon or a great den <laughs> for those in our union um, to receive the instruction. So Lisa, raise your hand. Lisa, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. 
and you can tell. Yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Lisa, if you have something to share, we can. Is she ready? Is she unmuted? I don't think I muted. Maybe she didn't mute. Don't know. Do you should oh, right, yeah. Press wrong button. <laughs> I actually have a question, just about you know, I'm thinking big picture. I mean, I'm assuming if a family was not happy with the services their child is getting in district and they school choice out the amount of money to a different district or a specialized sort of school would be so it's what i'm saying is it's worth investing in sort of making this the place that the kids yeah. are comfortable good. included in, in school from a, not only like it's the right thing to do but from a financial it's perspective it's absolutely the right if you're hitting them i don't yeah, know if you're impressive. going to end up going there or not um but that's absolutely one of the reasons for building the program is one you want to keep your students in your building once we create, once if we can no longer service students in our building, um, and they get, if we can't get the early intervention in, then we got to start putting into other programs. Mm -hmm. That includes transportation at three hundred dollars a day. That includes you know, and then the cost of the programs that can range from forty five thousand to one hundred thousand dollars, depending on those are just day programs. Mm -hmm. So, building a program, if you can do a building in house, and so it can also, if we build this, at some sort of capacity, you also can take students in. So let's say right. We, right now we're looking at next year. We're not looking at um, taking outside students in because we have enough. Well, we we think are going to you know there's IEPs and stuff and that kind of stuff that has to be worked out whether or not this can be the, the proper placement. But we can project that um, you know we're going to have five or six students in here in this program. Um, if two of those students, if this intervention can help. That can stop an outside placement will be will pay for itself um, over the years. Right now, we have a similar kind of program called Wings up in Conway. Conway's Wings program is kind of well known amongst elementary schools in Western Mass. Um, there's a waiting list to get in. People are trying to get in. Obviously, they take care of the residents first, and then they take care of Unit 38. And so we actually have sent students to Wings from here. That's three to six up there. So this is kind of you're going to kind of create your own. A little niche of a program that is very much needed mm -hmm. um and a lot of schools are trying to find trying to figure out what to do with either they have low incidence or um they have a program in place so the fact that we can get ahead and build the ability to um keep our kids in house and and the idea that you know and kim kind of talked about it and some of the language you use me to be able to understand but basically the idea it, you really should be talking about this but so maybe, <laughs> um that you have the den where students are going out and they have a place they can come back to and so they're not it's not a separate classroom separate down in the hall they're not interacting it's a place where they, it's a home where they can they can go out they can come back depending on how they're doing that day we, we see with these swings and that kind of stuff based on the, what their iep needs are um they might be able to go out for some instruction in the classroom morning time that kind of stuff they may have to come back for individualized instruction or small group instruction so that's the whole idea and the whole idea is that they transition out through the years and that by the time they're getting to the mid-range, mid-level classes, you know, depending on their IEPs, they're gonna be different people with different um, um, you know, rates in which they can um, you know, progress. It's, it's, you know, make a thing. So anyway, so absolutely the idea that this is, not only is it financially you'll see in a good spot, we also have the need. If we don't build this, we're going to be building it kind of internally anyways because these students are, are, are can't make it for a full day in a large classroom with the amount of stimulus and the amount of needs they have going on so we'd be doing something internally to this so this one kind of creates a dedication it's going to dedicate a teacher it's going to dedicate ias to that um mm -hmm. and as tina's trying to is working with the staff and also the other grade level teachers are part of that it's not a separate program it's their student and then you guys are supposed to be doing this. Um, and I, you got me going. You got me going. I love the word dead. Um, no, and, and, um, and the final thing is that we also are, um, as you'll see in a moment, that you know we have been reducing um, number of sections, which is increasing class sizes. So you're seeing class sizes in the upper teens right now. Um, and if the most significant students are receiving supports from a different from a different base, and those slightly, I don't know, 
they're mid size. I wouldn't call them large size compared to other elementary schools um, out there, but those mid size classrooms, those students who um, need more attention that kind of are receiving it, and you know, the slightly larger class can can function without that um, this teacher having to go to meet those needs. So, if that makes sense. I love the way you talked about inclusion because it's in, it's a cornerstone to the philosophy yes. that we have there. So thank you. That and the other thing I just wanted to add to that is we've had some brief initial conversations with a family or two, and the relief and the mm -hmm. gratitude coming. If you can only imagine walking in and the shoes there and and wondering, you know, I have a little one that is age eligible eligible for kindergarten but what do i do with the complications that are coming and it's really it's really a beautiful thing yeah. am i jumping ahead if i ask about one of your i'm just going to say that we're not new to programs here mm -hmm. but we this is something that we've done in the past and um, sometimes the student need isn't there so this isn't New to us, and we are. Um, you'll hear people talk about us as being an inclusive school, so we do really believe in inclusion, and this just provides the flexibility of where they're included and how often they're included. So we can support mm -hmm. any individual in that way. I think it's safe to say the LEAP program is a model similar to yeah. so similar ish, yes. Right? yes. So currently, we have the Go with Tina, take it from there. Uh, currently, a similar program that is uh, grades three to six right now because that's where the student needs are. We we have had um, two teachers in that program before. We call the younger one the junior, um, but with similar types of support. Some kids are in there um, receiving services most of the day. Some kids are just there as a touch point, like Darius said, and that can change depending upon a certain day for a student and where they are emotionally or regularly. So would this replace LEAP mm -hmm. or no. would we turn into that? Um, no. They, they probably no, LEAP is for the older students. Yeah, older students. Just for the three through yeah. six, yeah. this would be just pre-K yeah. to one for right now. Yeah. And then depending upon yeah. where the needs shift out into. So of course I've got like this image of a neat kind of, how does this manifest? What does it look like? Is it just, in name only or is there like a part of a room or yeah what is it like? um we have a extra i guess extra it used to be a preschool classroom so it's all set up it has bathrooms the sinks it's a kind of a contained beautiful room um last room on the left down the hallway that pre-k space right now it's a speech and language room um so we have the classroom for it and what else is there more to it i was just sort of you know i i i heard the name of it and i heard the who's going to be thinking you know who who's going to be supporting but i guess i just wasn't sure exactly what the what was the program what is the program Okay, how does it how does it work? Yeah, so it's a class, it is a classroom, it's a space, it's a dedicated space mm -hmm. with children that are coming in and out of the den, if you will, okay. but based on what they need. We might so say for example, you're going you're you're a child and um you haven't sustained a full day of school yet because of significant medical, mm -hmm. but we really need to promote early literacy, socialization, numeracy, all of those kinds of things. So you may be included in the kindergarten class for the first part of the lesson, mm -hmm. and then your stamina is waning. So you're coming into the den to be well cared of, the curriculum is brought into that, and we work on the pace for you. Then we, we look at all the different data points that we have and then the, the next inclusion piece would come out and it might look different for each kid and it's likely what we're hoping will shift over the course of time when they're with us so inclusion is happening more and more often mm -hmm. as skills and stamina and being a member of a community and and those real experiences occur and other times there might be a student that checks in in the morning kind of gets settled in for the day but that would become their um trusted space so if uh, other times during the day they needed to just have a quiet place for learning or check in that's available to them as well is that then specifically for this, this, this like only for the children who are yes. who have this 
them. Yes. Because the space where they would be. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. I just want to make sure there's no other curriculum or programmatic questions, which we can come back to as well if you think of something. Do you want me to move on to staffing and finances first? Or? Oh, you will. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, did I cut you no, off? Gosh, no, gosh, no. I was going to mumble, so oh. better. <laughs> this space better. All right, let's talk about staffing and finances, and then we can circle back on the whole conversation before we move on to other things, because there's still more to talk about. So we're going to call this level services plus modifications. We're not going to call it new initiatives or needs because there is a low financial impact here. Um, what we're proposing is some additional consolidation of grade levels. We talked about this last year with that third section that had the possibility to be reduced. We held off and kept uh, uh, three sections in, um, I think it was grade two, right? Uh -huh. Or... Grade it was two grade was supposed two to be year. three, but yeah. we ended up breaking kindergarten into three sections in first grade. So but. a little confusing when you think about the exact grades, but basically what we're proposing at this time is to consolidate that section that we talked about last year. And when you see the enrollment um, figures, which we're also going to talk about, there's opportunity for um, additional consolidation. We're basically reallocating salaries. So we do have a teacher retirement. We currently have in the budget 19 grade level teachers. Based on the sections that we're recommending, we only need 18. We have a retirement. So it's the perfect opportunity to reallocate those wages given our low uh, level service budget and roll them into this new program. And then the consolidation of an additional grade level, we're not eliminating a position, we're just um, reassigning staff and shifting staff so that everybody's in the right spot within the building to meet the needs of the students. So those two pieces will allow us to hire three new IAs, which will be needed uh, to support this classroom and have one special education slash grade level teacher in that room. Mm -hmm. The difference is only 700 or $7,200. $32 to the budget. Um, I want to speak to class size. So the grade that we're talking about consolidating right now has a class size of 12, 12, and 13. And we would be looking at, um, um, they would be 18 I don't and have 12, 12, and 13. So let's, let's jump ahead to the enrollment slide. So this is what, no, no, you're fine because I don't have that info that you just shared. I have what it would look like if okay. we did move forward with this. So that's important to know. So there is an asterisk next to second grade and the den because that's where the changes would come in. So as Tina just said, second grade what would be 12, 12, 13 yes. um, without this change. With the change, it'll become a class size that's much more consistent across the school of 18 and 19. And then the den projection would be between four and six kids. So we went through five in there. So that gives you. We also choice. want to speak to, maybe you're going to, no, the continuity ahead. of staffing too. So when you have the bubble year of two, 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 three, two, three, um, it requires shifting every year of mm. some teacher. And so honestly, when bringing it to faculty and staff, this is the preferred um, avenue. Mm -hmm. And this has been discussed already yes. at the school level with faculty and staff. So this isn't surprise information mm -hmm. to anyone watching or coming back to the recording. I had a, a question about sort of follow up from last year um, and have uh, relating to that whole question we had about what to do with the sections. How did it how did it go? Like, what's your overall take on, um, you know, because there was just making uh, given that you were taking three smaller classrooms, making them into two slightly larger ones, did it, um, are there any sort of any feedback on, you know, successes or challenges with that change? Did it um, work out? I think my initial reaction is no. I think it just went on as school as normal. But mm -hmm. what I will say is there was uh, one teacher that was saying um, it was a good move in the upper grades to have more kids in the class because they, um, needed to spend a little less time 
working pr productively on their own or figuring out how to solve problems where when you have a class of 12 and you have two um, adults in the building, they're getting that mm. that feedback right away. And I think it's good for them before they're heading off into like middle school, high school to have that class sizes that are yeah. a little more average. It's still under 20. Like they're still sure. talking about right. And these stuff. are not it's huge like, class sizes. Yeah. These I are want to clarify. moderate. If not yeah. pretty good standard, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. A lot of transitions are pretty important. Yeah. yeah. The big, big school across the street. Yeah. Thank you. So as things stand currently, like I said, the budget in this year has 19 grade level teachers. Um, we have the one retiree, so that's not any change to existing staff. That position um, could just fall off due to attrition. We're recommending reallocating those wages to this new program to help support that. Um, if we did not have the new program and the second grade classroom did still have three sections, we would likely be having the conversation about how to proceed with that. Do we keep it at three sections or do we reduce to create that consistency that Tina was just talking about? Um, we feel really strongly about the benefits of this program to the community. And I think that community is not just um, families and students, but also staff, that this is a good plan for everyone involved. And our recommendation is to move forward, especially given the low financial impact. You know, a $7,000 increase to add a new program um, is pennies, really, in comparison to the rest of the budget. Any other questions about this before we keep going? So other, other services would be needed and just handled from the staff we have now, like nursing or yeah. OT, PT? Yeah, kind of yeah. And um, let me just do a quick calculation in my head. Four of the students are already getting that level of student uh, yeah. services here. So it's it's not a huge weight for the related service providers. So I'll go back to the Den had its own line of five. They're not also in another grade? No, level? we took that. We okay. pulled them out of, of that grade. If it so, some of them are preschoolers yeah, yeah. right now. So we reduce the preschool line, and then I think there was a first grader maybe. Yeah. Um, and then there's a couple of potential new students, yes. right? Yeah. Residents though, not tuition yeah. based students. So you said five to six this year. How many more could this program absorb before we're looking at you need to add more staff or whatever needs to be added? Um, that's a really question. great question. <laughs> yeah. And so to also to when you talk about that, so first of all, it all depends on it depends on needs. So you take your residence needs first. And let's say let's say in two years' time there's only four students in the program. And we say, you know what, we really can handle five or six. And then at that point, the special ed directors are talking to each other all the time. And they say we have openings. And so that student would be placed in tuition in. Not for five thousand dollars school choice, but for fifty grand or more, depending on their services. Yeah. So it actually, Conway does very well. The amount of money it gets into its sped revolving due to means program because it, it really does pay. And if there's an individual IA with that, that money flows through as well. Yeah. So it is a. There is if you can support a program that gets a good reputation. Not only are you saving town money from keeping you and obviously the benefit of keeping your students in the house. A tuition or two in can offset the whole program and so it is something it's a when you have the ability to build it it's, it's not every i know the next thing your mind is then why isn't everybody doing it because one you have to have the you got to start with the administrative setup that's, that can support a program um and then you got to have the funds to start the program and usually with in-house needs where you're able to pull back so you're kind of in a nice spot you know it's kind of like why doesn't everybody go into selling ice cream? You know what I mean? Because it's the most profitable, you know, you know, kind of thing. It's just it's not as easy getting it off the ground. We're making it look really easy here, but we have people in the position. I'm looking at two veterans here, three veterans um, that know how to run programs, um, including Karen Ferrandino, who's been around a long time as well. So it's not like some new district or you know a new principal trying to take one of these off the ground is a lot more difficult than mm -hmm. someone who has a background in. Um, Behavior intervention and such. And you need the space. Right. We have the space we have with consolidated materials. And it's for the staff number two. And staff number two. Okay. 
Yeah. It works perfectly with the um, bear. Yeah. <laughs> we have all bear. Area. I, really do. I do love that. I do love that. I was to say that was all <laughs> That was his <laughs> contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Between you on that creation. No, no, that's why he really was oh, highlighting that, God. Mary. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I mean, you just want to curl up in the den right now, don't you? It's cold yeah. out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I got the DES part. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right, let's go back to presentation. We can certainly take more time for questions as we go through. If you think of something, jot it down, and we'll circle back to it in regards to this program. We are going to ask for you. Um, if you're not ready to support it now, at least continue thinking about it and then we'll come back to it in February, but we can certainly circle back to questions. So while we're on the enrollment slide, if I can talk about a couple of our other enrollment related things, not, not related to the new program, but just generally. So uh, we knew last year when we did the reduction in sections, it was gonna limit our opportunities for new school choice enrollments and slowly reduce the school's population as we go through the years. So we've seen over the last two years, roughly a drop of about 15 students over the last two years. Um, that's re part resident and part choice we will continue to see that decrease if we consolidate another class because the opportunities for choice are diminishing. Next, or the current year, the sixth grade class only has four school choice students. Um, but as, as you can see here, the current fifth graders, which are listed as sixth grade up there because that's next year's projection, has 10. The year after has 11. So you're losing just your choice kids alone, 21 students. We're not going to fill 21 spaces. There's just not going to be capacity for it. One, our classes will become too large, but two, we have to save space for if there's mid-year move-in for residents or summer move-in for residents as well, and consider the composition of the class with the existing students that we have on hand. So my point is, we're going to continue to see an enrollment decline. And that's an important component of this conversation. It's something we talked about last year. I just want to keep it at the forefront and as we go through the school decision. choice revenue. Yeah. So those numbers yeah. alone, you know, you're looking at at least, you know, 15 school choice, 15 times five, yep. you know, $75,000 just on the base before all the other um, money we get are on choice for spent increments. So our choice, our school choice revolving account, which has been our kind of our, We've always had it behind us to help us in case anything goes wrong. Sherry's going to talk about it more, but it's important to understand that we chose to go this way, but we it's also understanding that um, administratively, we always said, oh, we always have choice. If we get in the bind, we always have choice. Um, eventually, that's going to be um, a very small savings spot. How much do we pay to tuition for people who choice out? Do we know that figure? It's for 5, thousand per student. So that we know currently. Oh, like I don't have the out number. number. Um, I could look it up uh, quickly, but the town covers that expenditure. This it's not part of the school uh, budget. So the town I mean, ultimately <laughs> it is a school expense. They would consider it a school expense. But the way that the state works is they give you X revenue and then they assess you for things like school choice or charter. Um, special education increments for school choice, things like that. So they see a net revenue after paying for all those choice out students. But I could get us the exact number. But we would, in theory, if we all of a sudden had an influx of people choosing out of our district, that would be something we would be curious about yeah. and like wanting to address. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's my in, in, in the just FYI, that's different for Frontier. Yeah. Frontier, it's a direct correlation of if someone choices out, Frontier loses that money gotcha. off its budget. Gotcha. And so it's which is also significant this year when we start when we start having a meeting next month, that Frontier's choice is up and its increments are way up because the amount of charter is way down. Yeah. Wait, their choice out is, is way, way down. Choice oh, down is, is down. way down or and charter is way down. Did I say yeah. that wrong? So the amount of students leaving Frontier yeah. is way down. Gotcha. And okay. especially the amount of charter leaving Frontier, which is 20,000 to 5,000. 
is twenty thousand dollars for any student that goes to, to Chinese immersion or whatever any of the other charter schools. Um, the amount of those those students is way down as well. So the amount of actual revenue for frontier is way up. Gotcha. Okay. How many? Uh, sorry, one other. No, that's okay. Um, number of physical classrooms. Um, I was just thinking about when you're changing the number of classes, like there's classes and there's classrooms. And so you, because there's one that got um, reduced and that allowed for the den to be created. I'm just wondering, are there, are there 18 classrooms and that's it? Or is there- We have a lot of building space because we were set up to have three sections in each classroom. Okay. Um, and then there was extra classes. But So right now liaisons have classrooms and students are able to kind of join okay. those classrooms and have some quiet learning. Um, so we have plenty of, okay. plenty of space. So I was just wondering like if that was gonna create some big capital, you know, like thinking about the building and are there empty rooms and, don't go in there. Oh, we fill them. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Well, that's great to know. Um, Mitchell Ops is moving in. <laughs> start, that, start that rumor. Prior to having the extra space at liaison to a four for per room, so mm -hmm. probably not the best setup when you're trying to work in four different small groups mm -hmm. in one classroom. Mm -hmm. So we're, mm -hmm. it's nice no, to have the extra space. space. There were times, I'm looking at enrollment history um, from Jesse, even 10 years ago, residents were close to 400 mm -hmm. students in the mm -hmm. school before any school choice. So if we were significantly larger mm -hmm. than we are right now. Okay, a couple more things. Um, um, so yeah, sure. because, because we've consolidated classrooms, there are slots for school choice. If we changed our mind and wanted to, in some way, we don't have the slot. Very right now, very okay. So Tina will have that. So we'll have this kind of setting this up. But looking at this, you can see like first grade. Tina's going to have some discussion of maybe she'll be able to take you know 15 and 16. Do we leave open for two slots? You know, so there might be some adjustment. Looking in fourth grade, there might be some. Not sure there's anybody applicants for fourth grade. Usually, if you don't get them in kindergarten or first, they're not coming. So there might be some small amounts, but. Right, there's not going to be, because you also have to leave room for any residents coming in. So yeah. kind of, I actually attached the school choice recommendation sheet to the um, principal's report, more so so you could see class sizes depending upon what you were choosing. Um, but it, yeah, so it would look like fourth grade, you're correct. If we were able to look to see if we could add more students, if we didn't consolidate second grade, would be where we would look And that's not on science agenda. She's just kind of giving you the heads up ahead of time because it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other thing I want to note with enrollment before we go back to the numbers is just the staffing numbers that, that correlate with our number of students. So our total FTEs in the building for, um, educational staff so teachers and ias uh or anyone on the unit a and unit c contract is uh 74 ftes roughly uh, so that breaks down with this um new program having three new ias in it we would have uh 20 uh, i think 31 sorry we have 28 this would give us 31 um, and then the balance of the 74 is anyone on the unit A contract. So our student teacher ratio, our student staff ratio is, is four to one with a 300 um, student enrollment. Okay, a lot of info. Um, let's get back to numbers and, and money. One thing we haven't talked about yet are the true new requests and initiatives. So we talked about this program being new but that there's very minimal financial impact because of the changes that we can make with existing personnel and budgeted personnel. But there's always the consideration of new things that are needed within the school. Um, this ask of just shy of 25,000 is about a half a percent roughly addition to the budget and would bring our total budget to 2.43. So remember we started at, I think it was 1.83 at level services, added a little bit for the new program, now requesting about 25,000 for new initiatives. These really aren't new initiatives though, I wanna say that. They're things that we haven't paid for in the past because um, 
they're coming up as newer needs in regards to field trips and equity access that has to do with providing um, scholarships for families and students so that they can continue to attend all of our trips, but is also related to busing, making sure that we have the transportation for students with significant special needs, especially if they're in a wheelchair or require some type of specialized device to travel. So this piece is really important, not only to Deerfield, but goes along with that mm -hmm. equity plan mm -hmm. um, and speaks directly to school committee providing the resources to support equity and inclusion. Curriculum and consumables, or curriculum consumables, not curriculum and consumables, um, is related to the new curriculum. Uh, we did due diligence in looking at the previous curriculum and making sure that any of our consumables that we were previously purchasing, we accounted for those funds so we didn't just add them to the budget. Um, Laura did a great job working with principals to calculate how many you know, new workbooks we would need or um, each of the components for the different parts of the new curriculum. And then other supplies and materials that could be anything within the building really, and there's one word, word to relate it to is inflation. We haven't necessarily experienced these costs yet, but we anticipate costs of everything going up from paper for the copy machines to art supplies. So a pretty insignificant ask in my opinion compared to the total number and all very reasonable items that Darius and I support as being included in the budget. Does this include the fixes to the playground that we've been talking about, or is that in this fiscal year? Um, any changes to the playground would be under the bigger project that we haven't moved forward yet because we're still in the early phases okay. of so we have design. Plan for that. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that wouldn't be operations that will come from right. capital. We'll so we'll talk about, okay. and we're just about to go into those other monies we're okay. going to be talking yeah. about. Okay, so um, when you all see the line by line budget, which you don't have yet, but you will get, you'll recall there's several columns, there's the general fund, and then there's all of the grants and revolving funds, which I said is part of the puzzle for the budget process that we have to consider. Um, so what I wanted to give you is some revolving fund and grant information on the next two slides. So what we have planned in FY25 to spend some re from revolving funds and grants is on the left hand side of this slide. Um, you can see it's just shy of 800,000, uh, which means that with the 5 million budget plus the grant and revolving fund support, we're looking at about a total operating budget of around 6 million, which correlates at 300 students, roughly 20,000 per pupil. A lot of people ask for the pupil, per pupil cost, so that gives you some talking points in the community if you need them. Um, we rely heavily on grants and revolving funds, as you can see here, and like Darius said, uh, we're going to have to pay attention to the school choice numbers. What I want to let you know about the school choice account is that the 326,000 includes 90,000 for an out of district placement that we have been paying from school choice. That student is no longer going to be in district next year. So we're going to have savings. However, I'm keeping it in there because you never know what can happen. Um, if we don't spend it, it just builds up our balance at the end of the year. Uh, ESSER funds. So originally we talked about adding the 62,000 back to budget for the teacher wages this year that we paid in 24. Uh, Darius and I are recommending that we use some of our ESSER fund balance to cover employee separation costs, which is the contractual obligation for anyone who is retiring for the sick buyback. Deerfield is going to pay out um, like three and a half staff next year, which is almost $100,000. Mm -hmm. The budget has 30,000 built into the general fund already. We need another funding source. One of the options would be to increase the general fund budget. Not really ideal because it's a one-time expenditure. We don't expect to have this many staff retire at the same time in the future. So we look for other options. If we didn't have ESSER, we could be going to dip into school choice even further or talking with the town about if the possibility of other, any other funding sources. So ESSER has to be used by September. We have the funds available. It seems like a good use of those funds. So we're throwing that in there. Um, and then the other balance is on the other side. I'm just giving you the current, ESSER has 140,000 left after we spend what's left for earmarked for this year. 
back off the 70,000 for the sick buyback, we'll have roughly 70,000. Um, there are already placeholders in there to spend that money, whether it's stipends for curriculum development, summer support, uh, additional curriculum materials and supplies that are needed, uh, some building maintenance things. So there is a plan in place to use all of those funds so that we don't have to return any to the state because we don't want to do that. Uh, circuit Breaker. So Circuit Breaker is a special education reimbursement. We currently receive some Circuit Breaker reimbursement because of the out-of-district placement cost. With Circuit Breaker, you have to hit a threshold of, I'm going to say 50,000, just to use a round number. It might be like 46 something, it's 48. Mm -hmm. Even if it's 50, you have to hit 50,000, spend over that, and then they reimburse you up to 75% of the overage. So because our out of district placement cost currently is so costly, we see about $40,000 in reimbursement back from Circuit Breaker. We use that now to support the budget. Um, next year, it, this will get one more reimbursement because this current kid is a current student and you're always one year in arrear with this reimbursement from the state. So we'll see that money next year. We don't necessarily have a plan to spend it. We'll get two years to spend it down. Um, I would recommend that we hold on to it in 25 and see if there's any unforeseen circumstances that come up. Maybe we need one new one more IA in this program, depending on IEPs and student needs, or there could be somebody new that moves into town that needs additional services. Uh, so I would recommend holding on to those funds. Rural aid uh, for FY24, we have done a little bit of spending. The allocation, I think, was close to 97000 um, we bought some, did we buy new radios? What did we buy? We did, we, did. we bought more radios. Um, and then I think there was other, another small maintenance expense in there. So we've spent a little bit of that money. Um, and we're still talking about how to further spend that down this year. And then FY25, rural aid is subject to appropriation. Our thought with rural aid moving forward is that we find a way to help offset the budget with mm -hmm. those funds if it continues to be maintained at the level that it's at. Because, mm -hmm. you know, $100,000 roughly is about 2% of our budget. So yeah. it, it can be a huge support for our town. Next slide, I'm giving you projections for revolving funds. And these really are exactly what projection says. They're, they're rough estimates. So um, it's based on current year revenue and current year expenses, as well as looking back historically you can see that our funds are in a positive position. Uh, we do not have plans to spend any of the special education revolving money right now. Uh, two years ago, we didn't think we were going to have any funds in that account. And then we did have a student come in out of district for part of the year last year. So we do have 35,000 there. I would hold it. There's nothing that says we have to spend it. Let's save it as a, a, a placeholder for future special education expenses. School choices and our school lunch, I'm sorry, is in a really healthy position. Um, we're basically spending about what we're bringing in year to year. The state is pushing districts to spend their high balances. So I'm in continued conversation with the food service director about what other equipment do we need? How can we increase food quality? Um, what local you know, farm to table initiatives can we put in place? Mm -hmm. So those are conversations that are happening regularly. Early childhood. Uh, Kim is predicting we're going to be full. So these estimates are based off of um, prior year. You can see we're spending a little bit of our reserves, but you know, 35,000 in the bank feels like a good number. You know, if we had to hire an extra IA or um, you know, add additional services for that cohort of kids, we would have funds to do that. Uh, and school choice. So the end of your balance looks really healthy, having $900,000 uh, as our bank is a really good position for us to be in, but we cannot stress enough that our revenue is going to continue to decline. Um, the 300,000 that I have in there, I actually think could be a little bit high, which is not typical, usually I'm really conservative on revenue. Um, so that could end up being like 275, depending on if we fill those four spaces or not, but with the outgoing sixth graders. 
you know, and obviously we're overspending that, but our expenses are also holding the 90,000 for out of district placement that we don't actually need. I'm just earmarking it in case something comes up. So that balance should be higher. With that said, if we have drops for multiple years of 50 to 75,000 with the next two classes outgoing of 21 kids in school choice, we're going to have to decrease expenditures. And the mm -hmm. only place for expenses to go is to the general fund. So while we're in a really healthy spot with the general fund right now, being less than two and a half percent, even with some new initiatives and changes in the future, we might be talking about, you know, how do we absorb more costs? And if we don't absorb more costs, 900,000 at 300,000 in expenses is going to go really quickly if our revenue is not increasing. So I just want to make sure that the school committee and the public is hearing that message because it's really important part of the conversation. Um, we also have a placeholder of 50,000 in school choice for the front entryway project for overages. Um, the town has that MVP grant. We have funding from the town warrant that we asked last year to do the um, paving over again. We have a matching portion that we're kicking in already. And based on the early estimates, we think we're probably not gonna have enough money, even with all of those three dedicated pots, there's always change orders and overages. So we're holding some funds in school choice for that too. If we don't spend that, it just increases our balance at the end of the year. So it's just an account to watch really closely. All right. Historical information is up next. I'm not going to read through here the, the point that I want to make two things on here. Um, our increases have been pretty consistent between the two and a half to three and a half percent on average. So I think we're in line this year with where we need to be at 2.43. I also want to put in a little reminder that in fiscal year 22, the budget increase, I believe, was 3.36 on the warrant. And because of our budget freeze and the zero increase in 21, so in 20, we had a budget freeze because of COVID, 21, the towns, because we were expecting a loss of town revenue from the state of 20%, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that all four of our towns asked us to come in with level funding, not level services, mm -hmm. level funding. So between those two years, we were able to save up some additional funds we also had several LOAs and personnel changes that allowed us to have extra cash too. So on town meeting floor, um, which was actually the frontier field because we were still meeting outside, we weren't back inside yet because of COVID, um, we reduced the budget by $50,000 to bring it to 2.31%. And we also took off all of our requests for capital expenditures, which was about another 37,000. So that year in 22, we, um, help support the town by reducing school expenses by $87,000. So that's just a part of the story that we don't talk about regularly. I think it's good to remind us, as, especially as you're having public conversations about what the budget looks like. All right, we're almost done, I promise. Um, budget recap. So we started talking about uh, the drivers of the budget. 75% of the budget is related to direct student teaching and learning. Uh, wages, facilities, and operations, special ed and transportation are major drivers there. The challenges we face moving forward, um, enrollment decline and school choice opportunity for growth. And uh, the numbers, you can see there a reminder of what level services is, the increased costs for the new program, the new requests, and where the January 18th first draft falls at 2.43% increase over the prior year. That's it for me. Next steps. <laughs> um, so next steps, as I said, one, we can come back to questions if anyone has them. I know I gave you a lot of information and talked really quickly, especially about the program. If there's any questions while Kim and Tina are here, um, we are hoping to get approval to move forward with that so that these guys can start doing what they need to do far enough in advance. But if you're not ready, we can wait till February. Um, if you have feedback on the budget, we'll take it because it gives us direction where to come back at the next meeting for you. Otherwise, we sit tight and we'll bring you back more materials in February. You'll get a line by line budget so that you can see all of the expense accounts. There'll be a, a narrative coming, which is what you're used to seeing from me. You don't usually see this um, type of presentation, but 
<laughs> it'll spell out, you know, that way the public can see, you know, what the story is in paragraph form versus the PowerPoint. So um, more materials to come. But I think you, I, I mean, I think the, I think we have a solid budget plan here. I mean, there is, you could look at using um, rural aid to reduce it a little bit more, but I would wait for more information because the governor's budget is going to come out on the 24th, next Wednesday, and we'll know what she's recommending for rural aid. So we still have an idea. If she level funds it, we still have to be conservative. If she puts more into it, it may come back a little. So you got to give it a little buffer because they may end up cutting that depending. And right now the state's revenue is down. I'll be reading about that in the paper, but state revenue is down. So they're, they're saying be conservative in your budget. So us having a few extra um, little pots of areas where, you know, just outside of school choice might be a smart place to be for next year anyways. Um, so coming in at two and a half, or just under two and a half is, is probably might be a good spot. We'll also know, obviously, the town is watching what it's going to get for reimbursement from the state for the roads. Because if it doesn't get that, they're going to take a loan out. But you're just going to feel a general strain and also a general a general mood in town that there's money flying everywhere. So we may have to you know see where that money comes in. We get a lot of money there. They don't have to take a loan at all. You know, it, that may influence you know where what people are saying to us so another reason to kind of pause and not go 100 miles an hour forward on it and just be patient to february but I mean, it's one of the best budgets we've had um in the first read i mean i personally feel very comfortable voting <laughs> well taking a vote on the debt i won't say where i stand but i think it, it makes fiscal sense to me like it, it feels fiscally irresponsible not to do it regardless of whatever information comes out of February. Um, so I personally feel comfortable about that, especially if it makes your planning and sort of mm -hmm. your February presentation easier if you know that like this is a go and then waiting a little bit to sort of decide about some of the yeah. So you can't vote it tonight because we didn't write it that way in the agenda. Um, um, but what we're looking for, we're looking for, we're looking for, please move forward with the continued yep. programming of that. So you basically allows it. We're not going to sign any contracts with anybody yep. prior to the next meeting, but it allows the conversations to move forward. Um, and then we can bring back if there's any problems or anything. Like that. And yep. I don't suspect, but you're basically saying, please continue um, putting that program together and anticipating funding at their spring. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I mean, um, just my own thought about it is to, I mean, it sounds like you've thought this through incredibly well and made a great case for it. Um, and I'm only just like, wait, it's really just two point whatever, you know, like, <laughs> what are we missing? So I would say go back and make sure you haven't missed anything and that there's not like, oh my gosh, we forgot about that. Um, and so it's kind of how I'm thinking. That's but. what I think too sometimes when I see the numbers. <laughs> I'm like, are we sure? This is too good to be true, right? Yeah, how many times read this again, Darius? Yes. yes. What am I yes. looking for? Yes. When it's really high, I do that. And when it's really low, I do that too. So we'll absolutely go through every sure. and again. No doubt. I'm too strong. I heard it had more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, make sure you're not missing anything that you really need. Yeah, I'm comfortable moving forward with everything that was proposed and the additional programs and your requests. Look forward to see that in February. Great. Thanks. Absolutely. I think our children should be educated in their home school. And, mm -hmm. you know, I hope, or just know we'll have to sustain it. You know, I wouldn't want it to, anybody to have to make a change later on. Okay. And if the way we sustain it is to bring others in later on if our enrollment goes low. That's a great point. So all the sort of safely putting aside or not, oh wow, look at this, you know, like banking on the future, because that's what these this is what our schools are about. Mm -hmm. Um but uh um, yeah. Sorry, I had thought that it ran out the door. <laughs> I also, I know we focus on keeping the kids in their home school, but it provides value to every single student in the school who can share a classroom with oh, people yeah. who have different abilities or health right. status. So it's, you know, it's not just about like this one 
populations about sort of our whole community. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that brings back to what I was thinking was the idea of people move to the town to be able to <laughs> often for the school. So you don't want them to have to go elsewhere. And and exactly that, you know, people need to be, or at least my opinion is that the whole that holistic thing you're talking about is is about the multi-generational, multi-year of having that mix because we're too, you know, individualistically and um, siloed. So that's good. We'll keep working then. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Yes. Next. Right. Yeah. So for the candle donation, we're going to vote on that. Oh, you wanted me to talk about it? I thought you guys were, and I was just saying thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so Yankee Candle donated $4,000 to the school. Um, we're looking at using it to supplement recess equipment and cooperative games for winnings. So that the faculty and staff have really shown as a need. And this is where Darius would say, I think we need a vote, but I also just want to thank Yankee Candle publicly for consistently uh, yeah. supporting Deerfield and education. Yeah. Great. And it's really, really generous of them to do that every year. Every year. Yeah. All right. A motion yes. to. Are you making the motion? I'm making a motion to accept the Yankee Candle donation of $4,000 this year and gratitude. I second. All in favor? And we also are going to discuss the Exxon Educational Alliance grant. Yeah, so that's a $500 grant from Exxon, our neighboring um, mobile. I didn't know I was speaking to this too. <laughs> um, you can see this from the past, though, I'm sure. Yeah, we have, but it's it's worked differently. Usually he comes and presents a check and then I bring it to you and get it funded. But um, it, we we supplement our science and math. We, we can, they have us go online and um, apply for one of them, but they give us the 500 donation. Um, it really helps us with our math night to consistently thing is coming for family math night. So I think we need a vote and then um once we get a vote, please come in to see me. All right. Yeah. Does anyone like to make that motion? To accept the Exxon Educational Alliance grant for Texas Cowboys. I make a motion to accept the Exxon Educational Alliance grant. Okay. All in favor? Okay. All right. Yes. All right. And thank you to Exxon and thank you for the information. All right. Next up, reports. Uh, I have no report as chair. Collaborative report I send out via email. Um, happy to answer any questions if there are any, but that's the report. Superintendent's report. I'm just, I sent that out as well. The, the highlight uh, for Deerfield is that entry project, you know, the final. We have the final engineering plans, and so we're basically getting it ready to go out to bid. Um, we've also been working with the town because there's so many different funding sources coming in, coordinating with the town. Shelly had a meeting with the town last week um, to kind of make sure that we're all on the same page how to do that. Um, the two other uh, things that are Deerfield focused there is that there is a new health curriculum out and this year, and basically. Um, a letter regarding um, health and human development, otherwise known as sex education, was kind of sent out earlier this month, um, authored um, by Laura across the way here. But it's just, it, it does stir up um, conversations sometimes in the community, and certainly from students. So I'm just letting you know there's a little bit more going on with that new health curriculum. And it, actually, if you have questions regarding it, we do have Laura here. And then we also just had our tier focus monitoring review, which happens basically every six years with a three year in between where they come and they look at our special ed programs. And I actually had my debriefing morning, but we had our re-debriefing, re 
Deep, deep, deep breathing. breathing. <laughs> deep, keep your briefs deep on, but deep breathing <laughs> at, at, uh, at, at three this afternoon. So basically in about three months, we'll get a final report. Um, there was nothing too alarming what they told us, some minor paperwork stuff that we have to work on um, in some other areas of recommendation. But so we'll look forward to getting that and then making the corrections. So it's basically they find things out of compliance and then they give you a correction plan depending their correction plan is dependent on how severe it is. some of it is just like you know a letterhead on something correctly versus you know um you know you need to be filing things differently that kind of stuff so but there's nothing too alarming in the verbal report your report mentioned the transportation contract right oh yeah and transportation. i didn't talk about that i just realized oh yeah you know it's, it's the first thing on it. um we did just put out the transportation bid this week? Is it Monday or is it next Monday? Uh, last. This Monday. Last week. Oh, last week? Yeah, it's been on the weekends. All right. Anyway, transportation <laughs> bid is out there because um, we are um, the our, our five year bid in crypto is up this um, July 1 or June 30th. And so it's out to bid for another five year or whatever. And so we did that through FERCOG. And so about a month we'll be opening bids and looking at that. Have we always done through FERCOG? So procurement, um, yes, we've done a lot through FERCOG. Somebody got licensed in procurement um, through many classes recently. However, it's a lot of work. In the bigger the contract and the more moving parts, we really, it's worth a couple thousand dollars to have it being done by an outside group. Mm -hmm. um, they take care of all the legal paperwork, they take care of all the legal posting. It's just, we. We don't have the ability to do it in-house. Um, some of the smaller projects this spring, we're going to attempt to do some of our own or use a uh, online, there's an online company that's far less expensive for something like the fire alarm panel at Frontier. Very simple, straightforward. There's not multiple things moving, you know, that kind of stuff. It's not a five-year contract and that kind of thing. So we'll see how that goes. But um, for COG right now is overwhelmed. They have some personnel changes and the amount of if you can kind of look through just from us alone that's going to them in the last year we've had so many different projects go through them. but um the yeah. transportation bid last time was not through them though they were actually opened at the school i think um cms was here and i think yeah you're right i think judy who managed the whole thing when tms was here because andy Paquette was a procurement officer right i guess you're right i did open those yeah. Oh, there, yeah. 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 Um, but for a lot of our projects, we do use them. We just don't have the capacity. Like it would be the only thing that I do right now is monitor all the different project timelines and mm -hmm. deadlines and. Oh, yeah. there. Huh? That's why it exists. Yeah. 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 And they just they know <laughs> the law. Like I have the license now, according to the state, but. I don't do the ins and outs of that every day. So they really understand what we should and shouldn't do. They do an excellent job. I, yeah. And they continue to do an excellent job. That's why you keep going back, right? Yeah. It's like, why, why, why change them? Just sort of gives us some peace of mind, too, that we're following MGL and doing what we need to do legally. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. okay. If there's nothing else, we're uh, looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. I think I second that. Oh, I don't know. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 A